fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. good to see you this morning and uh, so good to be here in the house of the Lord and uh, we're just uh, grateful for that opportunity uh, if you're visiting with us we want you to feel at home as we worship the Lord together uh, and uh, we appreciate the flowers this morning uh, in memory of Miss Brenda Forrester for Brother Wayne and we appreciate him doing that and appreciate your help uh, with that every Sunday uh, we have some uh, openings that are available for this month and the next couple of months, so appreciate your help filling that. Please note the information about the uh, uh, children's home truck loading. Uh, it's uh, September the 28th, so we'll need it uh, that Sunday before, uh, but uh, they are asking for some specific items uh, that, are, that are on this brochure, so if you, can, uh, if you can help with any of that, if you will bring that, and uh, it will be much appreciated. Uh, they depend upon our association. Uh, we're, uh, from what I've heard, we're one of the, the bigger associations that really help support them uh, and the things they need. So uh, thank you for your support. Remember that uh, this Thursday we'll have shared blessings and uh, start at 1130. Uh, ask, uh, we'll ha provide the meat uh, and uh, ask you to bring side dishes. Uh, Brother Marcus Merritt will be uh, sharing with us a word from the Lord, and it will be a, a good time of encouragement. Uh, also note, we'll have call conference this morning. Got a couple of things uh, to present. Got uh, the nominating committee report for this uh, coming year, and then also uh, Bill and Grounds Committee has a couple of recommendations. Uh, you see all the other stuff that's listed there. Uh, please take note of that, which would pertain to you. We've got several uh, prayer concerns. Let me get my glasses out so I don't miss this up. Uh, Candy's asked us to continue to pray for her uh, sister, uh, Cheryl Johnson. Uh, remember uh, ULMA's brother, Billy Queen, uh, he, he's recovering from surgery, uh, but he fell and broke his leg, uh, and uh, uh, his son Brad is taking him to uh, make him, and they're going to do surgery on him uh, down there. Uh, <clears throat> Sandra Tucker's asked us to remember uh, Andy Sexton, this is Carol's brother-in-law. He's having heart trouble, uh, so remember him. Remember uh, the Robbins family. Uh, Charlie has COVID. Miss Kathy, uh, they're sending her home uh, possibly today or tomorrow uh, and looking at uh, uh, some type of hospice care, so uh, rem remember them. Uh, also, uh, Charlie's uh, son's memorial service was yesterday. Uh, Chris, so uh, just, just keep them in your prayers. Remember, continue to remember Brother Paul True uh, under hospice care at home. Remember uh, Karen's dad, uh, Charles Wellam, and Miss Betty. Uh, Brother Charles, uh, they put him on hospice care at home uh, this week uh, as well. Uh, remember uh, Brother Wayne, and his, he had cataract surgery last week. And I'm disappointed I don't look any better. I was hoping I'd look better. He said I did look taller. I do look tall, but uh, but remember him. He'll have uh, the other eye done uh, next week. Uh, remember Dory. Uh, she's having some. Uh, uh, there was a. I had my appointment Thursday. 
and nothing to worry about. Never mind. Amen. <laughs> it's a phrase. So it's a phrase. Amen. Amen. So uh, we're we're uh, we're excited about that. Anything else? Yeah. Oh. My brother Rodney, I'm going to go ahead and put that out there. Um, he went in for a heart scan, which was just routine, but they have picked up a spot in his lung. And they're really concerned about it. And, of course, they said as soon as possible. But as soon as we could get him in is uh, the 26th of this month. So um, we'll be going to see what that is. So I just want to okay. start praying that it's not anything. All right. Remember, remember her brother, Rod. All right. Any unspoken concerns? All right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the privilege to be here. We thank you for your love and mercy and goodness to us. And Lord, we just uh, thank you for this uh, cooler weather that's going to be coming uh, pretty soon. Lord, we just uh, pray for our country. Uh, we pray, Lord, uh, especially for our community. We pray for these on our prayer list. Pray for these that we've mentioned. Uh, we pray for these, Lord, unspoken concerns that you'll just be with uh, each and every need. Lord, we just uh, pray that in everything that we do here today that we might honor glorify you in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I'll turn now over to 217 this morning. Oh how I love Jesus. 217. There is a name
the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. When the long night has ended and the storm comes no more, let me stand in thy presence on that bright, peaceful shore, in that land where the tempest never comes. Lord, may I dwell with thee when the storm passes by. Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. This morning, if you will, turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians in the New Testament. Hope you've been reading uh, this book, and uh, we're going to be looking at it uh, for some time as we begin a series on this. We're going to look at the first, uh, first three verses this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to begin in verse 1, if you found it. If you're able, if you would stand as we honor the reading of God's word. And the word of God says, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, through the will of God in synthesis, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, unto them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for your precious word. We thank you for your presence here in our midst. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege that we are your body of believers that you have placed here in this location. Help us to understand who we are and the work, the very important work that you've given us to do. Have your way in our hearts and lives. Speak to us, but Lord, help us to respond appropriately. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I had something interesting happen to me this week. I hope you never have to do, uh, go through this, but you probably will. Uh, I think I kind of got in an argument with a computer. I was uh, calling a company trying to get some help, uh, and I had to talk to a computer first so that they could help me. 
Uh, and uh, the computer said, uh, would you please tell me what the problem is so I can know where to direct your call? And so I told him what the problem was. It was very simple. Uh, having trouble with the service. And the computer says, I didn't get that. For me to properly help you, you need to explain to me what your problem is. Would you please tell me what your problem is? So I repeat it. And the computer says, I didn't, I didn't get that. I was a little confused. This went on for about five minutes. And finally, you know what I did? You know the best way to argue with a computer? Hang Just hang up. <laughs> and I dialed again, and apparently I got a different computer, which immediately recognized what I was trying to do and actually got me some help. We live in a crazy world. You know... Uh, <clears throat> I'm all for people expressing their opinions, even if they're crazy and idiotic. Uh, but you know, some of these climate activists, uh, they're, going, they, they, uh, they're going to a new high, a new level. I was talking to Joshua last night, and we were talking about uh, some things, and he was telling me about, he said, Dad, did you hear about, uh, there was a guy in Germany that glued his hand to the air, to the uh, tarmac, to the runway. And, and I got to looking, and not only was there one person, there was, there's been quite a few in Germany. Uh, they're, they're trying to stop uh, air traffic for a while to uh, draw attention to the climate crisis that we're in, and they're disrupting flights. But the, but the crazy thing to me is this. They... They glue their hands to the tarmac with a combination of epoxy and cement. They're real smart, aren't they, David? To get, to get your hand free, they have to basically get a jackhammer out there to bust up the concrete and tarmac and asphalt, and then you're still left with a hand that's covered in whatever, and some reports said that they may even have to amputate part of the hand to get the stuff off. That's crazy. Just this Thursday at the Women's Open, the U.S. Women's Open, uh, there was a match between Coco Golf and Carolina Luchova. And in the beginning of the second set, uh, there was a disruption up in the uh, balcony section where four protesters began hollering to stop the use of fossil fuels. Uh, when security went up there to stop them and escort them out, they discovered uh, one of the gentlemen had glued his bare feet to the concrete. Fortunately, this guy was just a little bit smarter. He didn't use epoxy. He just used some kind of uh, super glue. And so they were able to extract his foot from the concrete after about a 49-minute delay. And you know, I got to thinking about all this. Now, folks, you know, I, like I said, I, I think it's okay to express your opinions, no matter how idiotic they may be. But folks, what good does this do? How does this really help their cause? Uh, how does this uh, advance their agenda? And, and then my second question is, why would anybody want to glue their feet or hands to cement or to a tarmac? That's just insane. And, and who, these people use an epoxy. If you've never messed with epoxy, I know enough about epoxy to know stay away from it. If you glue something with epoxy glue, it's, it's going to be there for, what, 100 years, David? Maybe? Maybe or longer? Yeah. You know. I mean, if, if, if you want to you walk around with asphalt hand the rest of your life, go ahead. Well, you know, what... what uh, what happened to uh, doing stuff 
if, if you feel so strongly about something, doing something that's going to actually make a difference, like uh, getting into politics and trying to pass legislation or trying to come up with a logical reason why this really matters, that people can accept and explain and understand. But instead, we've reached a point where people feel like that to, to draw attention to themselves, they've got to make it about them and disrupt everybody else around them in order to make their viewpoint known. Crazy. This morning, we're going to begin looking at the book of 1 Corinthians, and I think this is important because it helps us to understand who we are as the church. Who is the church? What are we to be about? I think there's a lot of confusion in our world today about churches and what it means to be a church and, and what we are to do in a church. And uh, uh, folks, we need to understand that the church is not a social or civic club or organization in the community. Amen? Uh, <clears throat> We're not a group of like-minded individuals who get together uh, to fellowship and spend time together doing things we like to do. That is not who we are. We're, neither are we an organization uh, in the community that seeks to just help people. Uh, I, I get this uh, every now and then. I'll get a call and somebody will be shocked because they think that uh, because we're a church that we just automatically, if there's some kind of uh, need that they have that we ought to just open our doors and, and just let anybody in and do whatever it is they want to do because they have a need. That's not why we're here. Uh, the church, uh, this doesn't apply here, but I've seen this other places. We're not here to take over and subvert the government. Amen? It's not why we're here. We're not here to try to bring heaven on earth. We are to represent God, but folks, we'll never bring heaven on earth. Uh, neither are we here to entertain or put on a show. Uh, if you came here to be entertained, or if you came to, for me to make you feel happy or make you feel better about yourself, that's not what, what, why we're here. Amen? Why? Because we are, as Paul says, the church of God. Paul writes this letter. He's, he identifies himself as an apostle called according to the will of God. Paul, uh, you'll remember, was originally called Saul. He was a Jew. He was a highly educated Jew. Uh, he was very uh, uh, knowledgeable about the law. He was an up-and-coming Pharisee. Uh, he would have really uh, been somebody significant in the uh, Jewish hierarchy. But he met the Lord on the Damascus Road one day. Amen? Uh, he was blinded by the light. He experienced the power and the presence of the Lord after he had risen from the grave. And because of that experience and because he had been called, he repented of his sins, he trusted Jesus, and he devoted the rest of his life in service to the Lord. And he spent the rest of his life as a missionary, preaching the gospel to the Gentile world. And because of him and because of his work, we have the gospel today. Amen? And he, and he wrote, God used him to write much of the New Testament. But he says here, he says, I am an apostle called by God. This is important because as we look at this book, we need to understand that what he's telling us is not his opinion. Amen? Uh, I mentioned this Wednesday night. Uh, we had about 14 folks here. We had a really good crowd. And if you don't come on Wednesday night, you ought to. So we study God's Word. But I made the comment. I said, we've got about 14 people here. I said, that means we've probably got about 25 opinions about stuff. 
Uh, and the same could be true today. Well, this is what I think. Well, well, I don't think that way. This is what I think. Folks, we need to understand this is not what Paul thinks when he writes here in the book of 1 Corinthians. He is writing as an apostle of God. An apostle is one sent by God. He's seen the Lord. Now, there are some who claim the title apostle today. But folks, we need to understand that's not biblically correct because in the New Testament, an apostle was someone who worked with the Lord or saw Him themselves. And I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody that's alive today that was alive in 33 AD when Jesus was killed. Do do, do y'all know him? Dave, do you know anybody? No, I don't know anybody. Uh, Wayne, do you know anybody? Mose, you, you... were you back there then? He's ignoring me. Okay. No! But we need to understand, he, he had a personal relationship to the Lord, but he also experienced his power and his presence personally. And he was called by God to serve uh, and to preach and proclaim the message of Jesus Christ. This is not his opinion. This is not what he thinks. This is the Word of God. And because he's been called, he has devoted his life to serve the Lord. Uh, He's living for Him. He's not doing doing this for himself. In fact, we know that uh, Paul... Uh, on one occasion when he was arrested, when they found out he was a Roman citizen, uh, you weren't supposed to arrest Roman citizens uh, unless they did something really bad, and he didn't do anything wrong. When they found that out, they got scared, and so they wanted to turn him loose. And, And what did Paul do? He said, I appeal to Caesar, which meant... Instead of him having to, to, instead of him being able to go free, that meant he had to continue in jail as they carried him to Rome till he got an audience with Caesar, which could take up to two years. But he did it because it was the will of God. Amen? He was willing to sacrifice his life in service to the Lord. Now he mentions here in this beginning his brother. So synthesis, uh, I have no clue who he, he is. Nobody else does either, so don't get too excited about that. But it was somebody uh, that uh, the church would know. It uh, was a brother, a co-worker of Paul, uh, and he's writing this letter to the church at Corinth. Uh, he wrote this letter around 50, 53 A.D., This is important. This was about 30 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, Some time has passed. This is the infancy infancy stage of the church, but but, but things are still new. Uh, They're still working things out, and and he's trying to address some issues. Uh, At some point in Paul's missionary journey, he goes there uh, to Corinth and spends about 18 months working with Priscilla and Aquila, uh, and they, they help uh, strengthen the church in Corinth and, and uh, help bring many uh, to the Lord. So he has a relationship with these people. He knows these people. You know, it's one thing to write a letter to a bunch of people you don't know, uh, but it's another thing to write a letter and say, uh, uh, oh, by the way, Karen, or, or by the way, James, or, or by the way, Tim, Somebody who knows who who you are and he knows the personalities and he knows the dynamics so he knows what they're dealing with. And and there's some issues there in this city, in this this church. And part of it came from from the location of the city. It was a very important port city. Uh, It was a very important part of the trade route and because of its location... Uh, they were constantly exposed to new ideas, new concepts, new people. Uh, and because of that, the city was covered up, this is, this is my language, was covered up in idolatry and immorality. Whatever the newest thing was, it came through Corinth and people willingly embraced it. 
And so Paul here in, in this letter, he's trying to address uh, some of these issues from this church. He's been away for about four or five years. He's heard about what's going on. I'm doing some introductory and then we'll get to the actual text. The main point of this book is that, and this is, this is important as, we, as you read this book, as we study this book, the main point of this book is that we are to be united as the local church as we engage in the work of the Lord. Now Paul deals with a lot of different issues. But, but we need to keep that focus that we are to be united as the church so that we might fully engage in the work of the Lord. We're not to be fussing and fighting. We're not to be going in a hundred different ways. Instead, we are to concentrate our efforts as we work together to do the work that God has called us to do. And what is that work? And Paul's going to tell us here in this book. That work is to preach the gospel, uh, to share the faith uh, with the laws that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to this earth, gave up His life, sacrificed His life so that we might have eternal life. Folks, that's the most important thing for us to remember as the church. Amen? That's what we're here for. Uh, we are here to reach the laws. But he also reminds us that the purpose of the church is to seek holiness and godliness. The church, we are to reflect the nature and character of God. We're going to deal with that in just a minute. We also, he's, he instructs us in this letter uh, that, that our faith should be demonstrated at home and in our marriage. Being a child of God is to impact every aspect of our lives. I remember I read a book some time back, uh, and this author was saying, people can believe anything they want to as long as they keep it to themselves. And he was specifically addressing Christians, and what he was saying is, whatever you want to do at home, uh, when, when the shades are pulled down, if you want to worship God, if you want to praise God, you do that. But when you come out that door, you don't need to impose your beliefs on anybody. Folks, if you've been born again by the power and spirit of God, it's going to change everything about us. Amen? And it's going to impact as we go out and work, as we go out in the ball fields or the grocery stores. It's going, to, it's going to impact everything we do. And the work of the Lord is to build up the church. The church is not here for our benefit, uh, but it's so that we can selflessly build one another up so that the church might grow, mature, and honor God. Uh, and then finally, the, the, the work of the Lord is looking and preparing for the resurrection. Amen. This world is not our home, and we're not going to live in this body forever. The Lord's coming back, and when He comes back, we're going to receive a resurrected body, and we're going to live in that body in heaven for the rest of eternity. And folks, that needs to be the focus of our life. And you may say, uh, well, why, why should I be concerned with this book? Well, he deals with a lot of important issues. Uh, he reminds us that uh, we're to seek that which is spiritual and of God instead of that which is fleshly and of this world. Uh, we need to make sure that we are growing and maturing in the faith. Uh, uh, folks, are, are we growing in the Lord? Are we growing? Uh, are we drawing closer to Him? Do we understand Him more? Uh, is our faith stronger? Uh, he, he chastises those who want to refuse to grow and remain as immature believers. He says this hinders the work of the Lord. 
He deals with the issue that we are to be selfless servants of the Lord instead of being self-absorbed and self-centered. And we need to live not according to the flesh, not seeking after the things of the world. We are to be the children of God on our way to spend an eternity in heaven with Him. We are to be submitted and engaged in the work of the church. And so Paul, to, to set uh, the foundation for that, he begins this letter with these first three verses. Uh, I want you to notice a couple of things here in verse 2. Notice the letter is addressed unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. Uh, we need to uh, uh, we need to be reminded that uh, there there is the universal church the the full body of Christ but folks we should never ever minimize the importance of the local body of Christ amen uh, the local body of Christ is the is the part of the church that God places at different parts of the world. And folks, we here at Union Grove uh, have been placed here by God to be His church here on Union Grove Road and Ben Hill Road. Uh, folks, we should never discount and dismiss the significance of the local church. We need to understand from a biblical perspective, if we're going to be engaged in the work of the Lord, we've got to do it through a local church. Now, I, I hear from some, I read this, I see it online. Some people talk, about, talk bad about the local church. Uh, they're not going to a local church. They, they love Jesus. They're not going to have nothing to do with a local church. Well, folks, um, they misunderstand the Lord's love for the local church uh, and that He wants His work to be done through the local church. Folks, we have a role to play in serving God. Amen? But I want you to notice also in that phrase, not only does He identify a local church, but he tells us that it is a church of God. Now the word church here is, is a Greek word. It's a, it's a compound word made by joining a, a preposition ek and the verb kaleo, and it means the called out ones. And, and it was used in secular Greek uh, to refer to assemblies or groups of people that were called out to conduct oftentimes the affairs of the community uh, or, or of the government itself. It's kind of like an official uh, summons to come and let's deal with some important matters. And folks, we need, to, we need to understand that we've been called by God to come together to do His work. Amen? Uh, it's not our work. It's His work. Sometimes we get a little possessive. I, I get possessive about things. Back when I was a kid, we, uh, our property backed up to a guy. We had six acres. He couldn't see our house. Uh, we had a lot of woods. He, uh, he decided one day that uh, he had a lot of trash he didn't want to carry to the dump, so he bagged it all up and threw it over the fence into our yard. I start to say I'm ashamed to tell you this, but I'm not. I found it walking the fence line, and you know what I did? I ripped that garbage bag open and I slung it across the fence. And he had about four or five bags. He had a mess to clean up. He didn't throw it back over anymore. <clears throat> Folks, 
We need to understand, though, the church is not about us. Uh, I heard someone who is a, a member of this church several years ago, but uh, in the 30-something years that I've been here, I think they've only been here about four or five times, and this individual said, that's my church! My church! Folks, it's not my church. Not your church. God's church. Amen? And, and when we talk about what we're doing, well, I don't like that. I, I don't like the music. Brother Dave, I, I don't like the music you're doing. We need to do something different. No. Folks, what does God want? Amen? Well, I don't think we are. No, it's not about what we think. What pleases God? Amen? Uh, <clears throat> Why? Because it is God's church. And, and he's, he's going to continue on with this. Not only is it God's church, but the reason why we are a part of it is because he says we've been sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now, that means that to, to be sanctified means to be set apart, but it is pointing to the experience of salvation, of being redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, when we repent of our sins, we trust Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and we go from being a sinner under the wrath of God, and then when we give our heart and life to the Lord, then all of a sudden the blood of Jesus has been applied to us, and now in the eyes of God we are righteous and clean as though we've never sinned before in our lives. Now, folks, how does that happen? It doesn't happen because we wake up one day and and, uh, turn a new leaf and decide to do better. Uh, It it doesn't happen because we uh, follow some program that somebody uh, sells us and we pay a lot of money and follow all these steps and then all... No. Nothing we can do will cause us to be sanctified and to be right before God. What Jesus did is the only thing. Amen? And and Paul is saying you're the church of God because you've been sanctified by Jesus Christ. In the eyes of God, at one point you were under condemnation and heading straight for hell, but because you've trusted Jesus, because of what He did on the cross, you are now a child of God. You're born again. Heaven is your home. And that is only because of what Jesus Christ did. And folks, we must never ever forget that. Uh, we're sanctified because of what He did. Because of that, we need to always remember we're not our own anymore. We've been bought with a price. Amen? We belong to Him. That's why we come together as the church of God. Because it's about Him. It's not about us. And and let me just say uh, this also. The, the, The wording there emphasizes that one, we didn't have anything to do with it. It was all Jesus. And secondly, it is completed, which means that uh, nothing else has to be done. Nothing else. Uh, And nothing else will undo what has been done. Amen? Amen? That means if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're saved. And there's nothing you can do to undo that. There's nothing the devil can do to undo that. And there's nothing Jesus is going to do to undo that. Somebody might say, well, preacher, that just gives people an excuse to live any way they want to. Not if they understand what Jesus has done for them. Not if they value and appreciate what what God has done. I, I remember Brother Howard Smith, one of our members here, uh, he was cousins with my grandmother, and they had this game they played. Granny would give them vegetables. Howard would offer to pay for them. 
He didn't want to pay much, but he wanted to pay something. <laughs> Granny wouldn't take money. She'd say, you're going to make me mad. So he'd find something that she liked, and he would bring her something. And, uh, and the next time, they would come, and they'd bring her some, some lunch meat or some Cokes or this, that, and the other. And you know what Granny would do? She'd go out and get something. She'd get more. And then Howard would have to go, go get something bigger next time. They, they played this game back and forth. Folks, if we understand what God has done for us, it won't allow, cause us to say, take all this for granted, but instead we will humbly bow and want to honor Him with our life. But notice also it says, not only have we been sanctified, but it says we've been called to be saints. Now this uh, may seem repetitious, but it's not. The, the first where it says here we've been sanctified, that refers to our position uh, with the Lord. This refers to how we should act once we come to faith in Christ. Now, the word means to be holy. Another way to put it is uh, we ought to reflect the nature and the character of God. Please understand, I'm not saying we are to be God, but we're to act like God. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, always amazed with genetics in families. And you know, uh, uh, some people... Uh, some people have a little quirky something about themselves, uh, about the way they do things, or the way they sit, or the way they talk. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and you see them, and, and, and you're like, oh, well, that's just them. But then they have children, or grandchildren. And all of a sudden, the children or grandchildren do the very same thing. Uh, my, uh, my neighbor in Memphis, he put in a pool. He was a big old fella. He probably weighed six, he was probably 6'4". Uh, uh, weighed, I don't know, 200, 250 pounds. He would get in that pool and he would just, he would just flop be dead, talk to me, and water would come up to here. And, and he'd say, come, come get in the pool with me. And I'm, I'm in there and it's, it's all I can do to keep my head above. And I'm like, what in the world? He had an, an extra large lung capacity. You couldn't sink him if you wanted to. And do you know his granddaughters were the same way. When they were born and they started using that pool, they found out pretty quick they wouldn't sink either. Uh, folks, if we're a child of God, we ought to want to act like we're a child of God. Amen? Now one of the issues that Paul is dealing with here is that there were some who were saying... You know, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, so I, I'm going to heaven, so it doesn't matter what happens to this body, I just do whatever I want to. And Paul says, no. If you've been sanctified, you've also been called to live a holy, godly life. You're to seek holiness and righteousness. It does matter what you do. But then notice he says, We've been called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here Paul reminds the church in Corinth, and he reminds us that we're part of something much bigger than ourselves. We're part of the larger body of Christ which is composed of every person who's trusted Christ and will trust Christ before the Lord comes back. We're called the body of Christ, but we are only a small portion of that body. Uh, 
The church at Corinth was guilty of doing what some churches do sometimes. They get so caught up in their own little world and struggle that they lose sight of the bigger picture. The church is not to be about what you or I want. It's not here to entertain us or to make us happy. We are here to serve the Lord and do what he has called us to do right here in Lithia Springs and where he has placed us. Folks, we have a specific task to do. And, 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 our, and our task that he's given us is part of a much greater task of where he's trying to reach people. And if we're not willing to be faithful and obedient to him, then, then that work that he is seeking to get done through us is not going to be done. We've been called by God to serve him and to use our life for him. We're the church of God. We're a local church. We've been sanctified. We've called to be saints, but we're part of something much bigger. And then he closes this by saying, grace be unto you. And we're going to deal with this more next week. But folks, God's grace has been extended to us. Amen. God gives us so much more than we deserve. Aren't you glad? Uh, God, God has poured his grace out. He, he's not given us just a little bit. He's not given us just enough so we can say he gave us something. Uh, he, gave, he, he, he gives us more than we can imagine. And because of that, we now have peace. We have peace. We have peace because we're at peace with him. You know... Uh, Mental health is a serious issue, uh, and it's uh, uh, a lot. A uh, lot of folks struggle with that today, and I, I'm not trying to minimize it. But folks, you will never have peace mentally until you first are at peace with God. And the only way you'll be at peace with God is to repent of your sins, trust Jesus. Become a child of God and realize He loves you. He loves you the way you are. He, he didn't want you to stay that way. and He's going to help you change and, and become more like Him. But, but He loves and accepts you the way you are. But then once we are at peace with Him, then we can be at peace with us. Uh, we, we're messed up. Uh, I... Uh, a while back, I was doing some research and uh, was, was uh, looking at uh, stories about people who were uh, modifying their bodies because they, it, it just didn't seem right. And, and people were doing crazy stuff to themselves. And folks, uh, this transgender issue, and you know, it, it's, it's all related. Folks, we need to be at peace with God but we also need to be at peace with how God made us. Now that's not saying, please understand, uh, that, that's not saying that, that, that it's okay for us to engage in our sinful tendencies. That's not to blame it on God. But folks, we need to, we need to uh, value and appreciate the fact that God made us in His image and we need to celebrate that in and of itself and be at peace with who God made us instead of trying to change it or make ourselves into something that God didn't make. And if we can find peace with ourselves... then we can find peace with others. Folks, if we're not at peace with God, we're not at peace with ourselves, we're not going to be at peace with other people. It just isn't going to happen. But it can. If we'll get right with God, we'll come to terms with how God made us and we'll accept that and be at peace with that, 
then we can be at peace with others. Folks, I don't know about you, but we, we need peace in our world. This, we, people get so upset about everything, and uh, we're, 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 we're on edge. Uh, I was talking to an Internet provider this week, and uh, they, by, by the time, after dealing with the computers, by the time I actually talked to human beings, I was so ill and irritated. Uh, but folks, we need peace today, amen? We need peace. Uh, we, uh, uh, and we need to demonstrate that peace with people we deal with constantly so that they might see what we have and want what we have. This morning, do you know the Lord? Have you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Um, have you given your heart to Him? Or are you part of the body of Christ? And folks, I, I didn't say this, but let me emphasize it, folks. The church is not whoever's on the road. Church is who's ever been sanctified, who's ever really trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Amen. Uh, we've got, I hadn't looked lately, I think we've got 500 members. Woo! Somebody said, Boy, you got a big church. I, and I tell them, Well, I don't even know half of them are alive. Hadn't heard, hadn't heard from 300 of them in 30 years. church are those who have given their heart and life to Jesus and are committed to in, being united here at Union Grove doing His work. Are we, the church, are we being the church that God wants us to be? Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for today, for Your love and mercy and goodness to us and the privilege just to be here in this place. I pray, Lord, that there's one here who does not know you. Lord, it, it uh, may be somebody that's uh, been coming to church. Maybe somebody that's a member here or somewhere else. But Lord, they realize they've never uh, taken the time to repent of their sins and to give their heart and life to you. And they're not part of the church. Lord, I pray that uh, this morning that they will uh, understand that and that they'll take that step of faith and come down the aisle and settle that issue. And Lord, we, uh, we pray also for us as your people. Lord, it's easy for us to get distracted. Uh, it's easy for us to lose our sense of priorities. Uh, but Lord, I, I pray that uh, you might use... Uh, this uh, book, use this message to encourage us, Lord, to be the church as we unite to do your work. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.